Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is Q&A number 105. Before we get into today's questions, big thanks to our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. And then they make electrolyte products that you can match to how you sweat and how much sodium you lose in your sweat in particular. And now with the Tour de France recently ending and PH being a sponsor of Team Sunweb, who did a really good tour with three stage wins in total, uh, there is a lot of data coming out from uh, on the PH website from Team Sunweb's uh, nutritionists who uh, talks about how the Team Sunweb riders hydrated and uh, ate during the tour and took on energy during stages. So that's really great content for you if you're interested in seeing how top riders, professional riders are fueling and hydrating during the uh, epic Tour de France that we just had. You can take a free online sweat test on Precision Hydration's website and you can get 15% off your order with the promo code DEATTRIATHLONSHOW15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka are the world-leading manufacturers of wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, high-performance eyewear and prescription glasses and sunglasses. And uh, they are super innovative. They All of their products have something that is really cool and unique about them when you compare to almost any other uh, product in the same category out there. So for example, in their swim goggles, they have a wider lens angle that allows you to not lift your head quite as much as you would with most other goggles when you're sighting. And this, uh, of course, reduces the the decrease in momentum that you get and normally when, when sighting. So that's just one example of a small but very important detail that can make a, a big difference. And uh, that's uh, Roka's goal to help you perform better, be faster in your races. You can get 20% off your entire Roka order with the promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. Now let's get on to today's questions, which are from Arno in uh, Antwerp, Belgium. And uh, Arno writes, Hi Michael, I just listened to your latest Q&A and I have some beginner questions. Uh, Thanks in advance for your help. And actually I didn't read any other questions because there's a long list of them. So I'm just going to answer them one by one. But these all relate, most of them relate to Ironman, half Ironman training, racing. And then we have some questions around base training and indoor bike training. But uh, yeah, keep in mind here from the perspective of somebody who is going to do their first uh, their first half or full distance Ironman. That's the perspective we're tackling these questions from. So the first question here is, uh, what are the key workouts you need to have done at least once before doing a half or full distance triathlon? All right. So what I would answer here is that uh, I'm going to answer what are the workouts that I recommend you have done, not the ones you have to do. This is something we talked about when I did a Q&A with coach Lachlan Kirin about Ironman training uh, a while back, maybe at the beginning of this year or so. And that's that what you have to do is not the same as what is recommended to do. You can, in many cases, get away with doing something different than recommended uh, if your goal is simply to finish the race, regardless of how you do it. If you have to drag yourself across the finish line, so be it. But uh, what I will answer here is what I would recommend doing, which uh, is what will hopefully make the experience much more enjoyable for you as an athlete. And uh, you will feel that you have the fitness to to do the Ironman properly and uh, you can stand on the start line uh, relatively confident and go and do it and you can stay in reasonably decent shape until the end and finish with a smile on your face. So that's the, the perspective that I will take to answering this question. And uh, also, of course, keeping in mind that this is for somebody doing their first half or full distance Ironman, but maybe they have, uh, I will answer from the perspective of somebody that has been doing triathlon for maybe maybe a couple of seasons, maybe just one, but one to three seasons of triathlon and now they're moving into doing half and full distance Ironman. So if we start with the 7.3 distance, then uh, I would simply recommend to have done the the distance of each discipline in training. So doing one open water swim that is at least 1900 meters, and it's important here in my opinion that it's an open water swim, uh, in terms of biking, I would recommend having done, actually, I would recommend having done uh, two 90 kilometer bike rides and uh, at least one of which I would recommend doing 
a 30 minute brick run off of it it could be 30 to 45 but 30 is is fine uh, you could do the 45 minute brick runs off a shorter bike ride as well so yeah i'm not too fast about it being a long brick run after the your longest bike rides and i would recommend at least one 21 kilometer run for the Ironman, my recommendations would not be to do the distance in all disciplines, uh, but on the swim, I would recommend doing at least one 3.8 kilometer swim and uh, preferably in the open water. Or alternatively, you could do at least a three kilometer swim in the open water and then, but then do a 3.8 or a four kilometer swim in the pool. On the bike, I would recommend doing a couple of rides that are around five hours or so. They could even be six hours, but I think like the minimum recommended would be a couple of rides that are around five hours. And after at least one of these, you would do a brick run that is 45 to 60 minutes long. And on the run, uh, so uh, I think that uh, if you, I'm not too fast about having to do like a specific long distance necessarily. Uh, if you are relatively consistently putting in runs that are 21 to 25 kilometers, or maybe even in the 24 to 28 kilometer range, but even so, even if you're doing 21 to 25 kilometers and you're doing that basically every week, uh, I think that's more important than the, than doing getting in like one or two 30 or 32 kilometer runs. Uh, so I'm absolutely not against doing a 30 kilometer run by any means, but I don't think it's a must or even like a top recommendation uh, because the run after doing the swim and the bike of an Ironman is so different from running an open marathon. Uh, so the intensity is uh, relatively low, but of course the level of pre-fatigue is very high. The demands in terms of uh, the metabolic demands, like having to keep fueling and having had to fuel during the bike, and, and hydration keep hydrating those are high but it just makes it a completely different thing than running an open marathon so uh, yeah if, if you want to translate that distance into a time i would say doing several runs that are between uh, two and two and a half hours is the main criterion there they will build up a lot of uh, fatigue resistance it's long enough for for that to happen uh, but uh, then uh, I also think that another important aspect of the run is to have done that 45 to 60 minute brick run after one of your long rides to see how that feels to run for a relatively long time, 45 to 60 minutes, at least not a, it's not a short time and see how that feels. And then other general requirements for both the half and the full Ironman is um, if you'll ride your TT bike in the race, then uh, you should be doing some specific outdoor training on the TT bike where you hope, if you can, try to simulate the race terrain. That's not necessarily possible if you're traveling to a race, but at least get outdoors and ride on a TT bike and use the equipment that you use in the race, use the nutrition and hydration strategy you'll use in the race and uh, yeah, try to make it as close to a simulation as you can. And uh, basically make sure that you can stay in the TT position for as long as it's needed uh, so that you don't have to get up and break position uh, very very often if at all and in terms of open water swimming same thing uh, you do the open water swim with both the tri suit and the wetsuit that you'll wear on, on race day to make sure that uh, if there's a problem with either the wetsuit or the tri suit in terms of it restricting your mobility that you can find it before race day and uh, again if possible if you have the opportunity to simulate race conditions by swimming in the sea versus the lake and so on then do that now the next question from Arno is what are the best shoes for the marathon in a full distance race? Shall I go for extra cushioning or comfort versus a normal marathon? Same question for cycling shoes. Do these exist for Ironman distance with more comfort so your feet are marathon ready? So uh, running first, uh, I used to run marathons before I was doing triathlons and I remember running some marathons in what was essentially racing flats that were meant for things like 5Ks, maybe a 10K tops. And uh, actually, I remember I was using Misuno Hitogamis. I don't know how to pronounce it, but brilliant shoes. I love them. And uh, and actually, yeah, I did use them in, in the marathons. And that was all right for me. But the key thing there is that I had used them in long training runs with the marathon race pace in these training runs. So I knew that they would work. And this is the key takeaway for this question, because there's no 
answer that is that can be generalized you need to try in training what you want to be doing in racing uh, so use the shoes you think you want to be using in the race in your long training runs and also in the brick runs of the bike and for cycling same thing try the shoes that you currently use in your long rides and uh, with you know, with the race setup that you have in the tt but on the tt bike in the tt position if that's how you'll race and uh, the socks that you're planning to planning on using if you're using insoles do you use those insoles and so on and if these shoes cycling shoes work fine in your longest rides then uh, whether we're talking about running or cycling actually you probably can go ahead and use those shoes in the race there's really nothing magical that's going to happen on race day and make them not work for the race if that is the case you have tried them in in training properly but if in training you notice that you maybe get blisters and chafing or uh, just don't feel comfortable for whatever reason then well you tried it in training so now you know you have time to figure out some change that needs to happen for you to avoid that on race day so so that's the key try in training what you want to do on race day but as a general guideline, I would say that in terms of running shoes, certainly uh, you want some amount of cushioning for the Ironman Marathon. And uh, yeah, mo- most people do anyway. So so I wouldn't recommend using your 5K or 10K racing flats there. And uh, I would also consider the fact that on long days of activity, uh, like an Ironman, your feet can swell up quite a bit and expand in volume for various reasons including the increased blood flow uh, during activity, but also including things like loss of electrolytes. So when you uh, get running shoes, in particular, if the goal is to do marathons and Ironmans and and such, then a rule of thumb is that, well, you definitely don't want to select anything that is too small, rather half a size too big than half a size too small. Uh, And uh, yeah, that's, that's a good rule of thumb. Make sure that the size is big enough and not too small, because when you then account for the swelling of the feet that potentially might happen then you might be in for some foot trouble in the Ironman otherwise and also consider the shape of your foot so in training in shorter runs you might get away with a shoe that has a too narrow of a toe box uh, and even in races like a sprint or olympic distance but as the distances get gets longer the small error in the toe box width can really become uh, exacerbated and you end up having a dreadful time for the discomfort so more important than cushioning i think is to pay really good attention to the overall fit of the shoe and for cycling same thing really pay the most attention to the general fit of the shoe and how it might change four to five hours into the ride if your feet start swelling and other than that there really aren't any ironman specific cycling shoes that i'm aware of cycling shoes that is Uh, but things like the stiffness of the sole could have an impact on comfort but in reality if your cycling shoes are comfortable enough that you can do all your long training rides in them then there's no reason you shouldn't do use them in the ironman as well all right next question from arno is planning for 2021 i also want to do a half distance race in the lead up to the full distance ironman what would be the ideal timing so I can do the half distance at full effort and be well trained, but don't impact the Ironman because of being uh, not being recovered from it? So this is a great question. And for intermediate or advanced athletes, I would say that you can do a half distance race two weeks out from an Ironman. That's still a great time because you can treat that as your last really hard weekend before heading into a two-week taper period before the Ironman race. For a beginner, for somebody who especially doing your first half Ironman and Ironman, and uh, so you don't really know how much time it will take you to recover from the half, I would say do the half distance at least three weeks out from the Ironman. So even if you find that it takes you uh, a week and a half or so to recover, then you still have plenty of time before the Ironman race to get in a few good workouts and then taper again properly for the Ironman. And as for how far out you can do it, so obviously not talking about you don't want to do it half a year out because then it's essentially a different season or a different half season anyway, then I I think that the, the sweet spot where you want to be uh, is uh, around six weeks out. So between three weeks and six weeks out from the Ironman, you already have banked a lot of your Ironman training fitness but you will also have plenty of time to recover from the half distance race, get some more quality training in 
uh, and when you have recovered from the half distance race and then taper for the full Ironman. So that would be my my sort of suggestion. Uh, try to do a half distance between three and six weeks out from the Ironman. Next question is, is it worth to invest in a TT bike for my first Ironman or 7.3? And if not, when is it? So this is one of those questions where it really, really just depends on you. But I'll give you sort of the parameters and the constraints of this problem. And then you need to figure it out for yourself. But uh, it, it all depends on your goal for the race. If your only goal is to finish and enjoy the journey, then you can just as well do it on a road bike. There is absolutely no need for a TT bike. Uh, unless there is an exception to this if you really want to finish the race and you know that you are on the slower end so you will be cutting it close with the cutoff times for the uh, for the bike for example or for the run for that matter then every minute that you can shave off your time is potentially going to be what what allows you to finish the race so in this situation then it makes sense to having the tt bike because it might be necessary for you to be able to finish the race and achieve that goal of completing it uh, but uh, the other situation is uh, if your finish time is of big importance to you. So let's say you want to beat a specific benchmark, like going under 12 hours for your Ironman. Then, yes, getting a TT bike would be important. Because it is very clear that a TT bike will help you go faster by putting you in a more aerodynamic position than on a road bike. Uh, but also, uh, it will impact your run. So even if you, let's say, put on clip-on aero bars on your road bike so that you don't lose that much time compared to being on a TT bike, you will lose time, don't get me wrong, but, but you will be a lot faster than by being on the hoods of your road bike. Uh, but the thing that will still be happening with a road bike and clip-on aero bars is that you will be riding in a position based on a road bike seat tube an angle as opposed to the steeper tri-bike or TT bike seat tube angle which would which puts you more forward and higher up and uh, that tri bike position compared to the road bike position will save your hamstrings and calves compared to the road bike and allow you to run better off the bike and uh, there is some research uh, on this that has uh, confirmed this to be the case uh, so uh, so that's a thing to consider that it's not just about the bike time but also about the run time but uh, but that's not to say that you can't uh, that you can't put put on clip on aero bars on the on the road bike because actually that is a very cheap alternative alternative method to make your bike go a lot faster or by putting you in a more aerodynamic position on your road bike that you already have uh, so again you won't be as aerodynamic as on a tri bike and you might probably lose some time on the run uh, but you can get pretty aero on the road bike and it's not going to break your run by any means you can still run and finish the marathon you'll just go a little bit slower probably so uh, and if you train for it then that's obviously the most important thing that whatever you do uh, try it out in training and train train that way train the way you race so uh, those are some thoughts uh, so again unless your finish time is very important to you then you can absolutely absolutely do the event on a road bike and the time to invest in a tt bike is really only when you start to really care about your finish time so that could be your first ironman or it could be never but that's going to be up to you as an individual uh, one thing that i want to mention here is that regardless of if you ride a tt bike or a road bike something you absolutely should invest in is a bike fit uh, so this is going to be of major importance to make sure that you have a, a good bike ride but also a good run off the bike and also if you are going to ride a tt bike Make sure you give yourself enough time to train on it. So uh, get your bike fit on that TT bike and uh, dial in that position well in time before the race. So you're used to how it feels and uh, so you know that you can hold that position continuously through the event. Next question is, how much can I gain in speed by investing in, in an aero helmet like the pros use versus a normal road bike helmet? Any key difference I should look at? So this varies a bit, but assuming you choose an aero helmet that suits your riding position well, then as a rule of thumb that uh, Dan Bigham, for example, has published on his Watch Shop blog, I'll link to this in the episode description, 
is that a 75 kilogram rider riding at 40 kilometers per hour can save almost 10 watts so at the same speed uh, they need to produce 10 watts less if they have an aero helmet versus a normal road helmet so of course i assume that as a beginner you are not riding at that fast speed for an ironman uh, and that means because you're riding at a slower speed that your watt savings will be smaller but actually your time savings should be roughly similar as a faster rider because you will accumulate those savings over a longer period of time being out there for longer on the bike course so a rough estimate is that a good aero helmet can give you up to five minutes over an ironman uh, this is something that i just did some back of the napkin uh, checking in best bike split and, uh, and so on so uh, yeah just as a rough rough estimate you you want to know roughly roughly how much you're going to save potentially by by investing in an aero helmet uh, the key thing there to look out for is how the helmet works with your head position when you're riding in your race position so for example if you have a very long tail hel helmet but you're somebody that looks down a lot when you're riding in the tt position then that's not good because the the tail of the helmet will just stand up straight up in the air and uh, be and increase the drag because it just increases the the frontal area of uh, you as a as, as a vehicle the bike and the rider uh, and uh, the tail of the helmet you want it to fade into your back sort of without an abrupt gap that would be the ideal helmet the one that has a tail that allows you to do that and depending on your head position this might be a long tail or a short tail or a medium tail helmet so so that's really where you want to know roughly how you have your head positioned if you're riding in the tt position and uh, and if you are if you're not then i think that the aero helmet actually i cannot answer if the aero helmet is going to help give you five minutes if you're sitting up on the road bike uh, that i don't know but if you're in the clip on aero bars on the road bike then i think it will be roughly the same uh, so and just to give you my helmet experience i'm now using a cask bambino pro evo uh, but uh, i haven't really done any any testing other than visual inspection but visually it does look good like i get that uh, the tail fades into back transition that i want uh, especially compared to what i used to have with the giro aero head that i used before so i'm quite positive that the cask bambino is more aero for me but that's the key thing that this is because of my head position and your head position might be different so this is where you need to talk with somebody who who knows a bit of what they're doing uh, when they're when you're selecting the helmet and ideally you want to try them on and try them on maybe on the indoor trainer with some mirrors that you can or somebody filming you so you can see which one visually ends up looking the best so yeah that's that's helmets next question during winter and as an age grouper bike riding during the week is often in the dark and a bit less safe should all the hours then be done on an indoor trainer what is best to invest in wheel on direct drive how should i train on swift should i just do two to three uh, rides on the trainer during the week and stick to longer outside rides in the weekend so uh, this is a very broad question and uh, lots of it again comes down to personal preference but uh, in terms of riding indoors versus outdoors i think there are many advantages to doing what you suggest doing the weekday rides indoors and then going out on the weekend if you can if you live in such a climate safety is definitely one of the biggest advantages in winter time to doing those weekday rides indoors uh, but for me as a coach for example i would never decide for one of my athletes that you need to train indoors on the weekdays and outdoors on the on the weekend if they have the terrain and the weather to execute the training that i prescribe them outdoors or indoors i'm happy for them to do it either way they prefer the advantages of training more outdoors if it's possible includes getting more practice in bike handling skills and getting more practice in translating power to speed which i think in this uh, kind of indoor heavy climate and i'm definitely part of that myself uh, i think that uh, that's sort of a skill that is important not to lose and not to lose sight of how fast do you go not just how much power do you produce and at the end at the end of the day the way to get to the finish line the fastest is not to produce more power it's to go faster what does your speed sensor say so so that's another skill that you can improve more if you train more outdoors 
And uh, also for those athletes that prefer to ride outdoors year long, uh, it's generally, I think, because they just enjoy it so much more than training indoors. And of course, that enjoyment is of massive important importance as well. However, I do think that with the right indoor setup, you can make indoor training very fun and entertaining. Uh, the first thing that I always say that you need is two great fans to prevent, prevent you from overheating and also to prevent underperformance due to this overheating. Second, one thing that has made a huge positive impact for me, uh, just in terms of like the enjoyment of indoor training, is uh, getting a Wahoo desk. Uh, so that's one that you can uh, you can set to the exact height that you need it to be for your riding position and where you want your screens to be placed. If you have Swift in front, which I do on the iPad, on the Wahoo desk, and then you can place bottles and nutrition there and so on. So it makes it super convenient and uh, yeah, and it also looks nice. I also installed gym floor tiles so as not to get my floor all wet. I have a mat under the bike, but uh, the sweat does seep, seep through the mat. So I needed an extra layer and the gym floor tiles uh, helped me with that. So now I don't need to worry about cleaning up, like uh, wiping the floor clean after every ride. And that's another thing that makes it more enjoyable. And there are many more small but important changes like this that will make your indoor training a better and more fun experience uh, fun workouts is of course a huge one uh, obviously and many of my athletes do the workouts that i prescribe them in training peaks uh, they just take them uh, to swift they move automatically to swift and then they can do them on swift with that visual stimulus of cycling in the virtual world and uh, that is actually what i do myself as well with uh, with my training but then uh, maybe for some steady endurance rides, you might just want to uh, do something that other than just stare at Swift, you might want to have Netflix, watch something on Netflix or uh, Spotify, listen to music or uh, have a good list of podcasts or audiobooks, Triathlon Live TV to watch triathlon races from the WTS circuit and the World, the World Cup circuit. Now the tracing is on again. So really what it boils down to is in itself, indoor training is not as fun as outdoor riding because you don't have the speed, you don't have the wind hitting your face, you don't have the excitement of fast cornering, but you can replace some of those uh, really, truly enjoyable aspects from outdoor riding with different but still enjoyable aspects of indoor riding. So uh, that was a bit of a, a tangent, I think. But uh, yeah, basically, it's your choice. But many athletes, I think, choose indoor training but then they don't go all the way they don't make the effort to make it as fun as outdoor riding and then they kind of waste the winter not training as much as they should or would like to because they're not enjoying it but you can make it enjoyable that's the whole point of <laughs> of that uh, slight tangent that i made but uh, for the trainer uh, it's obviously going to be budget dependent which trainer you choose uh, a wheel on or direct drive but honestly, if you have the budget, then I would say that a direct drive trainer like a, a Tax Neo 2 or a Wahoo Kicker, they're kind of the gold standards. Uh, and uh, check, check out dcrainmaker.com. I'll link to it in the episode description. He has full gear and product reviews, uh, much more information than you'll know what to do with, honestly, but really good reviews on, on bike trainers and trainer recommendations for different budgets. So go and check that out for more information. But I do think that if you have the budget for a really good direct drive trainer and you pair that with having Swift, then yes, you will be spending more money, but also you'll be setting yourself up to really enjoy all of your indoor training. So it will be money well spent and you will also become more consistent in the end because of that increased enjoyment. And in terms of your how should I train question, well, uh, you ask about uh, how to train on Swift and you should know that Swift is uh, by no means mandatory. And also that Swift is not a training plan. It really is only there for your entertainment. Uh, so, and as an example of how you don't need Swift, I stayed in Finland between November 2019 and January 2020. So three months I was there. Uh, and needless to say, every bike ride I was done indoors. And I did this on my very old uh, wheel on uh, trainer. And no, nothing smart about that trainer, I'll tell you that. And I only had my Garmin watch as my training device or screen. And I used music or podcasts or sometimes for longer, low intensity rides, I used Netflix uh, for my entertainment. And really, it was quite monastic uh, when I compared it to my setup here in Portugal, 
with a Tex, uh, Tex Neo 2 direct drive tra- trainer and Swift for entertainment, great fans and everything. But uh, yeah, I did it for three months without Swift and I actually really enjoyed the process of training so much that I just didn't didn't really mind. But uh, definitely when I got on Swift, when I got back to Portugal, it has made my indoor training more entertaining. So that's why I'm on it. But again, for you, it comes down to do you enjoy it? Do you think it's worth the monthly subscription fee? And if not, then uh, there's no reason that you have to be there. You can just uh, do your training uh, on your trainer, record it on your watch or your bike computer, and that's just as good. And uh, on to how to train. Well, I definitely think that winter time uh, is a good time to work on that aerobic base and getting in a good amount of work in zone two, if we're talking about the five zone system from zone one to zone five, zone one being the lowest intensity and zone five being the highest. So a comfortable but not super duper easy PC intensity. But I would also say that uh, you can and probably should have some sort of moderate or high intensity training uh, every single week in your plan. So uh, this could be something like a zone three tempo ride or some sweet spot intervals or even some high intensity intervals. There are many different ways to periodize your season. So I won't say that one is better than the other and you should do this and not that. But to give a con- concrete example of what your training might look like, let's say you're on the bike three times per week. So then you could have your uh, long outdoor or indoor ride on the weekend. So that would be a zone two ride that is quite a bit longer than the other rides. And then you would have uh, a weekday ride with some, for example, zone three work. So it could be, depending on your ability and your training volume, it could be two times 20 minutes at 80% FTP, or it could be three times 20 minutes, or it could be even be four times 20 minutes, all depending on your ability, your level, where you are in your season. And uh, then the final weekday ride in this scenario or example could be a ride that is mostly just zone two riding, maybe high zone two riding, but with uh, some surges at very high intensity. For example, every 10 minutes of a 90 minute ride, you could be doing uh, 30 to 60 seconds at 120% FTP uh, or 130% FTP even if you're doing 30 second surges. surges. So uh, so as not to lose the top end. So uh, so that's, that's an example of how you can structure your training. And that will give you a lot of time in zone two. Uh, but it will give you a good tempo ride and it would also give you some maintenance for that VO2 max. But uh, the best thing you can do uh, to really dial in your training through winter is to get a training plan or, or even better, get a coach. And uh, I should mention at this point, because so many people are asking about it, uh, yes, scientific triathlon-based training plans are coming. Uh, it's in the works, but uh, it is unclear when. So it might be November or December. So that's just for all the people that have been asking. Now, the final question from Arno is, how long does a typical swim training week look like in kilometer or hours during your key training months and weeks for half or full distance Ironman? I normally do three kilometers per session, two times per week. When open water training is possible, the distance per session is increasing to four kilometers. So I would say that you're doing well with uh, what you're doing uh, for if your goal is to complete the Ironman, for example, uh, I would say that what you're doing is great to getting your three kilometer pool swims and four kilometer open water swims. Uh, that's uh, that will prepare you well enough, I, I would think, two times per week. I do generally prefer to have a swimming frequency of three times per week because of how technical the sport is uh, because i think that frequent exposure is important to to improve that technical aspect but if your schedule only allows for two swims per week then i would say that in the last six to eight weeks before the race you could actually try to uh, make sure that at least one of your weekly swims would be in the 3.5 to 4 kilometer range and uh, regardless of whether it's outdoors or indoors have one of those swims be close in distance to to the Ironman distance Uh, so it doesn't have to be exactly 3.8 but trying to get up to 3.5 kilometers at least as uh, as a benchmark so so yeah and you could even be using buoyancy shorts or wetsuit for some of those swims maybe not all of them but some of them and they would be perfectly fine so these distance guidelines however uh, do change for swimmers that are on the slow end of swimming 
because I would say that if you are in the pool and uh, you get to 90 minutes into the workout and you haven't done the whatever distance your program says, then at 90 minutes, you've probably done enough. Uh, we, we're talking about beginners here, remember? So for some advanced athletes, you might actually benefit from doing longer swims than that. But uh, but at 90 minutes for beginners, even training for an Ironman, there's no need to do more than that, I don't think. So uh, yeah, I hope that this helps Arno and that I answered all your questions adequately. Thank you for sending them in. And uh, for everybody who might have questions for future episodes, uh, send them to michael at scientifictriathlon.com and that's michael with a k you can find links in the episode description to dc rainmaker that i mentioned for product reviews uh, the article by dan bigham on aero uh, savings from different pieces of equipment and also some interviews that i've done on uh, on aerodynamics and aero savings from different pieces of equipment with dan bigham and with josh portner and finally, a base training episode that I did with uh, coaches James Teagle and Larson Kieran from Scientific Triathlon. So uh, check those out in the episode description and uh, check this episode out on scientifictriathlon.com on the Q&A page. Uh, you can also check out training plans and coaching information there. In particular, if you want to take a proactive approach to achieving your goals next season, then now is the time to start looking for a coach really because now we're heading into that all important base training phase so do consider the coaching option and reaching out to us if you have a vision for what you want to achieve next year in triathlon and you are serious about accomplishing it big thanks to our sponsors precision hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com go and take the free online sweat test and get a personalized hydration strategy and get 15 percent off your order with the promo code that triathlon show one five and thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, dry suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon. <laughs>